Hello and welcome to lab three. We are talking about distributions this lab and we're going to talk about distributions a lot. Let's take a look at the syllabus quickly to see that we've got uh, distributions one, distributions two, distributions three. Everything is about distributions. One of the great things about using R is that in terms of statistics, we can get a very good, strong, hands-on sense of what we're doing, both in terms of descriptive statistics and inferential statistics by understanding how to uh, work with distributions. And so the whole point of this lab is to begin that work. We've got two sections, a practical section on sampling from distributions in R and a conceptual section on Monte Carlo simulations. We'll be doing lots of both of these things throughout the rest of the semester. Uh, I'll also note that in the generalization assignment, uh, we've got two problems that I think will be pretty easy for you after we work through uh, this lab. The third and the fourth problem are, I think, advanced problems. I'm going to ask you to try them. And of course, again with Lab 3, there will be a solution video posted uh, for these, I think, slightly more difficult problems. So let's begin. Uh, practical section one, sampling from distributions in R. First of all, what is a distribution? For me, a distribution is a place where numbers come from in a very abstract kind of way. Like, where are the wild things? Or that book, Where the Wild Things Are. You know, the weird invisible monster things, they come from a place, this crazy land. For us, distributions are places like this circle, and uh, numbers come from this place. You know, for example, this thing made some numbers. It made the numbers one and two. So this is a little number machine that in my weird number world produced these two numbers, one and two. So my general definition for distributions is a machine or something that produces numbers. And more specifically, um, uh, we can talk about distributions that produce numbers, particular kinds of numbers with particular probabilities or frequencies. And when we talk about a probability distribution, we might say, you might see something like this. Here is a pretend distribution. And this could be representing the number zero. And this could be roughly the number one, number two, number three, maybe negative one, negative two, negative three. And if you saw something like this, this is going to describe the various probabilities of pulling out certain numbers. So you could pull out a number zero, it would have the highest probability. So if you're going to take a number out of this thing, pop a number out, it's probably going to get a zero. So lots of zeros are coming out of this. Um, how often will you get a one? Well, not as often as you get a zero, but you get some ones, you get some negative ones out of here. You'll get lots of zeros and ones and negative ones and things in between, like 0.5 actually will happen quite a lot because it will happen more than one even. You won't see very many threes, but you might see a three once in a while. Uh, you, you'll basically never ever see a really big number like 100. This distribution wouldn't let that happen. It could happen with a very, very, very small probability, but it's probably not going to happen. Okay, just a refresher on some of the things you've been learning in stats class. This is stats lab. We do things slightly differently. And we're just gonna talk about making R, uh, basically uh, defining your own discrete distributions in R and sampling from them. So imagine you had this imaginary bucket and you put in this bucket some things, like here's a ball with the numbers one and two and three on it. This could be a distribution. If you blindfolded yourself and then went in there and grabbed one out, like grabbed the number one, so you pulled a one out of here, you could put the one back in. You could replace it, and then you still got three in there. You blindfold yourself again, grab out a number, the number, maybe you get a two. I mean, every time you do this, you keep doing this, you're going to only get ones, twos, and threes. 
And if, if you're doing it randomly, you should have an equal chance of getting these things out. Uh, we can make R do this. We can model this kind of drawing from a, a bowl of things. We could do that with sample. So we're going to talk about sample. Let's uh, jump over to R and take a look at the sample function. All right, now we're in R. I'm looking at uh, creating your own distributions in R with the sample function. So if you go question mark sample, you can read about the sample function here. I've said that it takes an input X. This is basically a vector that describes what is in your bowl, what could be sampled. You get to say how many things you want to pull out of here. That's the size. You get to say whether replace equals false or true. If replace is false, once you take something out, the only things that you can take out after that are what's left. If you say replace true, when you take something out, um, uh, we're going to put it back in before you take another thing out. So the last thing is probability or prob. This defines the probability of selecting any of these things. By default, it's set to equal probability. So let's take a look at sample. And I've just created some silly little problems. For example, create a distribution with two equally possible numbers, sample from it twice. So what I'm doing, just to follow along, I made a bowl. I want two things in it, a one and a two. And I want to sample from it twice. So I want to draw out, you know, a one and a two or a two and a one, whatever happens to be. Sample from it twice. Here, we define our x to be the values one to two. And we're going to sample from it twice. Press play. And look, we sampled a one and a two, and a one and a two, and a one and a two. Oh, this time we've got the two first, and then the one, then the one, then. So every time I press play, we're getting uh, a resampling of this process. Now let's look at the next one. Create a distribution with two equally possible numbers. So we've got that set up. We've got our one and a two right here. And sample from it 10 times. Okay, we're gonna just set size to 10. Now we need to set replace to true because once we've pulled out our first thing and our second thing, there's no more things in here. So we can't sample 10 times. There's only two things left. If we want to sample more than twice, we need to set replace to true. And that will effectively mean that once we pull out a one, let's say, we record that we pulled out a one, but we put the one effectively back in the bowl and let it be sampled out again. So the next time we could get a one or a two, and the next time we could get a one or a two, and the next time we could get a one or a two. And we're gonna do this 10 times. So let's do it, press play. So there we did. We just sampled out uh, 10 things from this little bowl that has two things in it. Every time we press play, we're gonna redraw those samples. So you can get lots of different things could happen in terms of what you take out of here. What happens if we set this to false? You know, this is impossible because we can, once we take two things out, there's no more take out. We'll get an error. So. If you uh, get this error, think about what you're asking R to do. So we'll leave it at true. Let's move on. Create a probability distribution where the first number has a probability of 90% of being sampled. The second number has a probability of 10% of being sampled. Now sample from this situation 10 times. So we've got a bowl. We've got two things in it, a one and a two. We want to make this one be chosen 90% of the time, and this one be chosen 10% of the time, right? And then we want to go two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Then we want to go and sample 10 times, see what happens. So all we need to do here, it's basically the same as what we had before, but we're just going to add in this little statement here. The first number, in the prob vector is going to define the probability of sampling the first thing in the x vector. 
the second thing is going to define the probability of sampling the second thing. So we've done it. Let's press play. We should be getting lots more ones than twos. So here we got all ones. We got all ones again. I'm pressing play. I'm pressing play again. Oh, we got some twos, but you know, mostly ones. That's because one has a 90% probability of being sampled here. Oh, we got three twos. So it can happen. All right, we, we I think solved this problem. Let's keep going to number four. Create a distribution to model a coin flip for an unbiased coin. Flip the coin 10 times. Have the distribution return heads or tails. So in this example, I'm showing you that whatever we put in the x vector, um, we'll sample from it and return it. So it doesn't actually need to be a number. It could be heads or tails. It would be basically like saying in our little bowl, we have the word heads. Whoops, let's see if I can write the word heads and tails. These are the things in our bowl and we wanna sample them out 10 times. So we're ready to do it, press play. So now we're sampling out the words heads or tails. And uh, if we don't define a prob statement, each of these things will be sampled out with equal probability. And this is basically a way to make our pretend to flip coins. In this case, we're pretend, uh, making our pretend to flip the coin uh, 10 times in a row every time. All right, finally, create a distribution that has the numbers one to 1,000 and allows them to be sampled with equal probability. Sample 10 numbers from this distribution without replacement. That means if you have not sampled one number, um, sorry, if you have sampled one number, you're not allowed to sample it again because it has been taken out. So the idea is we want a bowl. It's got all the numbers from one, one to 1,000 in this bowl. And I'm just gonna go all the way to 1,000. There's a lot of numbers in there. We wanna take out 10 numbers. This is kind of like uh, the lottery, right? With that machine with all the balls in it. Every time you take out a ball, you put it here, you line it up and you see what number it is, whatever numbers we're gonna get. If we already took the three out, we can't take it out again. So there'll only ever be one of each number in there. And we've set that up. This creates the vector of values from one to 1000. So it's like putting all of those things in our little bowl and let's press play. And there we have it. We've just drawn out 10 numbers between one and 1000 randomly. And so every time we do this, we're gonna get different samples, uh, be like different ways to win the lottery. Great, so the sample function can be used in lots of different ways, and we'll use it many times in this course when we come up with other more specific problems uh, that require us to define some kind of situation or distribution and then sample from it. All right, let's move on. Um, we'll also be playing with more standard kinds of distributions. And I'm going to show you the normal distribution right now. You might have remembered or known that the normal kind of looks like this. Sometimes it's called the bell curve. And the normal distribution has a mean parameter, which is the center of the distribution, and a standard deviation parameter, which kind of makes this thing go um, uh, tighter or narrower. And <clears throat> although uh, the shape of the normal, depending on how you zoom in on it, is basically the same no matter what. Uh, I'm not sure if that came up very clearly. The point is, uh, we could use our functions to sample from the normal distribution. And there's lots of distributions in R. If you type question mark distributions, and press return, you'll see there's a bunch of them here. So we're looking at the normal distribution. You could go down and click this button. And then you'll see a few different functions for accessing a normal distribution. We're gonna focus on the bottom one, the one that begins with R, 
and then norm, short for normal. This function has three things, an n, how many numbers to sample, a mean to, dis, to define where the center of the distribution is, and SD for standard deviation to define the standard deviation. So if we do this, we will sample random deviates, random sample or random observations from this distribution. And here's another way of writing it. Uh, so we're sampling 10 numbers uh, from a normal distribution with a mean zero and standard deviation one. And every time we do this, we'll get different numbers. We can quickly visualize this. So here we're going to sample 100 numbers from a normal with mean zero, standard deviation one, and use the hist function to look at it. There you go. Now, does that look like a normal distribution? Kind of. How about if we make the sample size 10? Now, it, you know, it's, it kind of looks like lots of different things. Let's make the sample size 10,000. That's starting to look more normal. How about 100,000? Yeah. All right. So as you can see, as we decrease the sample size, the sample becomes more variable. As we increase the sample size, it starts to look more like the population distribution the sample came from. All right. We can also use ggplot in order to uh, visualize our data. Here's an example of doing that. And here's the ggplot histogram. Uh, all we're doing is first putting our sample data into a data frame. So we're sampling 100 numbers from a uh, normal with mean zero standard deviation one. We're putting in a data frame structure. We're calling this item sample data. And we're going to just create another column, call it sample to tell us which sample it is. So if we looked at this my data uh, data frame, check it out. It's just got uh, sample data. These are the individual observations from the normal. And we're saying, well, this is a, this is a sample we took and it's, we're just call this sample number one, it has all these things in it, 100 observations. And ggplot requires data frame inputs. Uh, and so we're going to say uh, the x axis is going to be the sample data from that contains all of our values. And this is the syntax for asking ggplot to return a histogram. It's you add on the geome underscore histogram. And there, there you have it. We can make this histogram look nicer, but we'll skip over that for now. The reason I wanted to uh, take the extra step to put our sample into a data frame and plot it with ggplot is because we can go on to do a few extra things. For example, um, let's visualize multiple samples with individual histograms for each one. So what if we wanted to sample 25 values from a normal distribution and we want to repeat this four times? We will have four samples. Um, and each containing 25 observations. So let's take a look at what we do here just to see where we're headed. We've got sample data like before and a sample column. If we scroll down though, we'll see that the first 25 are for sample one. Now from 26 to 50, it's for sample two. And then for 51 to 75, sample three, and 76 to 100, sample four. So now we've taken four samples, each with 25 observations. Look how I did this. The first part of the data frame is the same. I'm taking a total of 100 random samples from a normal distribution. Because um, my goal is to do 25 for the first one, 25 for the second one, 25 for the third one, 25 for the fourth one. And that's a total of 100. So I just did all of that in one go. In the next column, 
I want the first 25 to be associated with the first sample and the next 25 to be associated with the second sample. So what I need is a vector of 25 ones, 25 twos, 25 threes, and 25 fours. And we can make that using the rep function. So the rep function is pretty cool. We haven't talked about it before, I don't think. But if you want to look at it, do question mark rep, and it helps you replicate things many times. So you could say, I want 25 ones. So I want to repeat one 25 times. There you go. What if you want 25 twos? You could do like that. Uh, if we said, I want, well, I want 25 ones and 25 twos and 25 threes and 25 fours, we could do something like this, but it's not going to be quite exactly what I was thinking in my head. Check it out. We're going to, this actually rep replicates one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, 25 times. This is fine, but I want it to be more orderly for me to look at so I could see 25 ones in a row. So if we throw on this little command each, it will do each of these things 25 times. So then we get it to look like this. And that's all I've done. I'm, this is, I'm just making up data this way. And why I did that is because if we then tack on one more thing with ggplot called facet wrapping, we can create multiple graphs um, very quickly. So let's check this out. So now we're looking at a histogram for each of the four different samples that we took. And that's a pretty quick way to start visualizing uh, sets of things with ggplot. So I thought I'd show that to you. Okay. So we're about done with normal distributions. We're going to move on to the uniform distribution, sometimes called the rectangular distribution. And this one is simply something that looks like this. There's a starting value, could be anything, um, let's say zero to one. And the idea is if you take numbers out of here, any number in between the starting and stopping value, you could take out and it would come out with equal probability. So everything in there is equally possible. If you said, take a number, you could get a 0.5 or a 0.99 or a 0.01 or a 0.3, 4, 5, 7, whatever. Any of these numbers will happen and they all happen with equal frequency. We use the R unif function. That is R for sampling a random deviate, and unif is short for uniform distribution. It has three parameters. N, how many things to take out. Min is the starting value, and max is the ending value over here. So very quickly, I just said, let's sample 1,000 numbers between 0 and 1. Okay, if we do that, we get 1,000 numbers between 0 and 1. And I put that inside the hist function. So this will actually show us a histogram of our sample. And as you can see, it's not totally flat like this rectangle over here, but it's pretty close. If you go down, make make the number of samples much smaller, you can see that the sample doesn't always look like a rectangle. Uh, if we make the sample much larger, it starts looking like more like a rectangle every time. Now I'm doing, this is pretty cool, like I'm doing a million and almost every time now we get a nice flat histogram. So leave that at I guess a thousand. Okay, here, sample and plot 10,000 values from a uniform distribution between 100 and, and 1,000. So we're doing 100 here and 1,000 there, and we're gonna take out one or 10,000 numbers. And here's what we get. Looks something like this. 
Now let's take one sample of 100 numbers from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. Okay. And then we're going to investigate the sample a little bit. So we've got our uniform distribution from 0 to 1. We want to take out 100 numbers. And then we want to look at these numbers and we want to count how many numbers are less than 0.05. So, you know, that's, that's around here. Like most of the numbers are going to be over here, right? Larger than 0 0.05, but some of the numbers, like we might get some numbers that are smaller than this 0 0.05. The task here is just to, to simply get the numbers. So we've put them in my sample. So there they are. And I can look at them. I, I don't really want to go in here and look and count myself how many of them. Oh, there's one. Smaller, that one's smaller than 0 0.05. So there's at least one uh, this time. What I want to do instead is have R figure this out for me. So I'm using logical indexing. And first thing I'm going to do, well, I'll break this part down. If we did just this line, just this part, my sample less than 0 0.05, what's going to do, it's going to go and evaluate for every number if it's true or false that the number is less than 0 0.05. And you can see it's mostly false, but there's some trues in here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The eighth thing is true. So we went up here and looked at the eighth thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's our number. The eighth thing is smaller than less than 0 0.05. So using this logical comparison, we get a vector of true and falses. If we pop this inside the square brackets, this will return only the values inside my sample that meet the true uh, quality. So there's four, so it returns the four things where this is true. Notice the first one is that first value that we found right over here. So in this case, there are four numbers that are smaller than 0 0.05. And I want to ask the question, how many is this? So I've, again, used the length function. So it returns 4. So when I sampled 100 numbers between 0 and 1 in a uniform distribution, I got 4 that were less than 0 0.05. Every time I press play, it's going to do it again. So this time I got 6. This time I got 5. This time I got 5. I got 2. I got 3. I got 7. I got 0. I got four. If um, things are working properly in R, on average, how many should I get? Well, I would say, think about that. If there's um, yeah, I, I mean, it should be uh, roughly, we've got a hundred values, and this is roughly. 5% of the distribution, I would say about 5% of our sample should be numbers in about here, right? And 5% of 100 is 5. And so we should be getting about 5 values that are in that space. And as you could see, we don't always get 5 sometimes, but we're getting numbers around 5. Right. Okay. I mentioned already that there's other distributions. You can find them. Other distributions in R you can sample from. You can find them with question mark distribution. I'm just going to show you quickly using R EXP for sampling from an exponential. And there we go. Looks like this in terms of your distribution. We could sample from a binomial distribution. Here is sampling 100 values. Um, from a binomial where the 
outcomes zero or one are equally probable. And here is a Weibull distribution. Looks like a combination of a, a normal and an exponential a little bit. All right. So now you know that you can sample using sample from a distribution using uh, the sample function and from normals and other distributions using those uh, base R sam uh, distribution functions. In chapter five, in Vokey and Allen, you also learned about skewness and kurtosis. So we talked about the mean of a distribution, the standard deviation of a distribution, and there's these higher order statistics, skewness and kurtosis, describing other aspects about the shape of the distribution. If you want to compute these things in R, I'll just quickly mention that you could install the moments library. So you go to packages, install, type in moments, and press install. After that, you can use the skewness and kurtosis functions. So you could load the library, compute a, or generate a sample of numbers. So I generated a sample of 1,000 numbers from a normal distribution, and then I could compute the mean, the standard deviation, the skewness, and the kurtosis, and a histogram. So that's what happens here. And notice the skewness is, um, I'll just do that again so we could see it. Skewness is kind of close to zero because the normal is symmetrical. Um, oops, yeah. I think I skipped down. So sample a normal, look at skewness, and it's close to zero. Here, I'm sampling from an exponential that is really right skewed. And we can see that with the histogram. So the mean here is 0.48, the standard deviation is 0.48, and the skewness is 1.8, indicating right skew. All right. That is the end of our practical section. The next thing we're going to do is talk about Monte Carlo simulations. So we're on to conceptual section one. All right, back talking about Monte Carlo simulations. Many of the remaining labs will involve some form of Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation is one where you take a sampling process and you repeat it hundreds or thousands of times in order to figure out what happens. It's kind of like running an experiment on your computer to figure out what happens. You know, for example, if I said something like, um, if I flip a coin 10 times, So I don't know if this is going to be heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, 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 tails, tails, tails. I mean, that could have happened if I flip a coin 10 times. Lots of other things could have happened too. I mean, I could have got nine heads and one tails. I could have got 10 heads and zero tails. Lots of things can happen. So what is the probability that this happens? Or what is the probability that this happens? Another way of saying it is, if I repeated the process of flipping 10 coins, or I coin, sorry, 10 times, 10 flips, let's call it flips. How often does this happen? If I repeated this um, 100 times, how many times out of 100 would I get 10 heads and zero tails? If I repeated this a million times, how many times out of a million would I get 10 heads and zero tails? I don't want to do that in real life. That would take forever. However, if I did that in real life, I would get a really good sense of how often different things happen. 
in a Monte Carlo simulation, we let the computer do the work of doing those things that many times, and then we go in and look at it. And this is super useful because we can figure out answers to these kinds of questions, which are funny toy questions about coin flips. But more importantly, we will see that we can gain insight into all the rest of our statistical inferences we'll be making. Um, and we're going to use Monte Carlo simulations to better understand these uh, many aspects of uh, basic statistical thinking and statistical formulas and statistical operations that we will use. So my goal here in concept section one is to uh, help us learn how to conduct a Monte Carlo simulation. Now I want to point out that I'm just going to call this a Monte Carlo simulation, MCS. I'm drawing a cloud here. This is a fluffy cloud. All right. And why did I do that? It's because this is an idea. Uh, you can accomplish the idea in lots of different ways. So bear that in mind. When we try to ground this idea, and this is, I don't know, grass indicating ground, something like that, <laughs> we will implement the idea in different ways. In general, though, Monte Carlo simulations in R will involve repeatedly sampling something. So I've got here, we need to simulate a repeated sampling process. We need to save what was sampled on each iteration. And then we, ne we need to do our sampling as many times as we want. And we need to evaluate what we did. Okay, let's start off with um, a coin flip, just to get an idea of what's going on. So we know that a coin is fair if it comes up heads equally often as tails in the long run. How could we use a simulation in R to demonstrate this or look at if it's true? I want to have a way to sample the outcomes of a binary variable, a variable that has one of two outcomes, one or zero, and that could stand for heads or tails like a coin, only has two options. I want to take several samples. I want to basically imagine I flip the coin and record, oh, I got a heads, I got a tails, I got a heads, I got a heads, I got a heads, I got a tails, I got a tails, I got a tails, and so on. And uh, when I refer to the long run, I'm talking about doing this for a while. And every step of the way, let's figure out, have we got an equal number of heads and tails? And so we're going to um, set this up using the sample function, and we're going to use a loop, a for loop, because those are some things we've learned about. So let's take a look at what I've done here. And I do this whole thing all right here. I'm going to first press play and then just show you what's going on and explain it. So I've generated this graph. This is a graph of me flipping coins. The question I've asked, I started flipping coins, heads, tails, heads, 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 and the R generated its own series of heads and tails. What I've done at each step of the way is I've asked what proportion of my coin flips turned out to be heads, all right? So uh, you can see that for the first few coin flips, the proportion of heads is zero. So that means that the first few flips must have been all tails. And then we start getting some heads. So at each step of the way here, I'm asking, what is the proportion of, of heads in total? I just save that result and then I plot it. And as you can see, as we keep flipping the coin, it starts off, it's not 50-50, and it's, it gets kind of close to 50-50. It kind of wanders away. It's, it's getting closer by 100. We're getting closer to this red line. What's neat about all of this stuff is, oh, I'll show you, once I s set up the code, we can start changing parameters. So let's flip the coin a thousand times and see what happens. So at the beginning, it kind of bounces around not close to 50-50, but as you can see, once, we've, once we're flipping it like past 750 times, we're seeing that, yeah, it, it is balancing out to be 50-50 in the long run. And that is the point 
demonstrating this with R. So let's dig into the code and see what's going on. The first thing I'm doing is I'm initializing some variables. So let me clean up my session and talk about what I'm initializing. So I, I'm going to create all these things, a flip vector. It's currently null. I, wanna, I want to um, record how many flips. I want to store this information. So um, I'm thinking, you know, I, I'm going to flip a coin one time, two times, three times, four times, five times. I want to figure, I want to go back in the data and see what happened at every single flip. So this one is going to store numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Right? It starts out with nothing, but I want to put those numbers in there. I want an outcome. So what is the outcome going to be? Well, I want to store what happens on each flip. So I might store, um, I'm going to use numbers to store this. So I'm going to say a one is a heads, all right, and a zero is a tail. So what might happen on the first flip is I get a one. On the second flip, I might get a one. Third flip, I might get a one. I might get a zero, a zero, a one, a zero. I'm storing the outcomes of the flips in terms of zeros and ones. That's what I want to do. And then every step of the way, uh, so that's called proportion heads. I'm just going to write that as P heads here. I want to calculate the proportion of heads that I have at uh, this current moment in time. So after I flipped the coin once here, I got a heads. How, what's the proportion of heads that I have? Well, basically one. And 100% 1 of the flips have been heads. How about here? Well, two out of two were heads, so one again. What about this one? Three out of three, still 100% heads or ones. How about now? Oh, we've got three out of four are heads. So that's going to be 0.75, right? And then, we, oh, here we go. Three out of five, and I don't know what that is, but three out of five, right? And then over here, it's going to be four out of six, and so on. So I want to calculate these proportions. And, and just to be complete, I will also calculate the proportion of tails, which is going to be one minus the proportion of heads on each go, right? So P tails. We can see that it's in the first flip, there was no tails, zero out of one. In the second flip, zero out of two. Third flip, zero out of three. The fourth flip, we got one out of four. So that's a 0.25. And that's uh, also one minus 0.75, right? So I've just laid out the kinds of things I want to accomplish in R. At this stage of initializing variables, all I've done is written names for these things and created them with the combine command that makes empty vectors ready to put stuff into them. Now I'm going to run the simulation. And I get to choose in the simulation how many times to flip the coin. So in the loop, I create a for loop and um, the number of elements in this vector will determine how many times I flip the coin. So I will just set it back to 1 colon 100. We'll flip a coin 100 times. And we know now that this will produce the numbers 1 to 100. Remember, these are the very same numbers that I want to store in my flip variable. So let's think about what happens on the very first coin flip in this loop. On the very first coin flip, and I will just write this in R, I will be assigned the value 1 because the first thing in this vector is the number 1. So now in the loop, we need to think that I is actually a 1, right? So in the first step of the loop, what will happen here? This will be equivalent to saying flip one equals one because the I is a one. 
So this effectively assigns to position one of flip the value one. Great. This is a way of saying we're going to do flip number one. Now we're going to go and flip the coin. We're going to accomplish that with the sample function. We're creating a vector that has the elements one and zero, which means the only things that can come out of this are one or zero. And we're going to sample one thing out. Remember, if we do this, let's see what happens. I'm just going to keep doing this. I'm going to scroll up so we can see what's going on. I like to do this sometimes. Now we can see that sometimes we get a one, sometimes we get a zero. These are different coin flips. And when this occurs on the very first iteration of the loop, whatever happens, it's going to be a one, it's going to be a zero. It's going to get assigned into outcome at position one, because remember, the I is a one. So we'll save that value in the first position of the outcome variable. Now, right now, I have an I, and it is a one. So if I was to run this line, it would be exactly like saving a coin flip into position one of outcome. And I just did it. The very first coin flip was a one, apparently. Okay, finally, we're now on this part. After we've uh, stored that, we've done our first flip, we've stored the outcome of the first flip. Now we want to calculate the proportion of heads that we have. So the question is, um, how many ones do we have here in the outcome vector? divided by the total number of outcomes. So we're going to take the sum of the outcome. Um, and remember, our outcomes are either ones or zeros. So if we just sum up the vector, the sum will tell us how many ones we have, because the zeros don't add to the sum. Right now, we only have one thing in there. It's a one. So the sum of one, it's like doing this. It's kind of silly. The sum of one divided by the length of one is a one. We got a proportion of heads being one. I've set up, uh, and that's going to be saved into the first position of the proportion heads variable. For proportion tails, I just calculated as one minus proportion of heads in position one. All right, that was a long way to walk through this loop. Um, but let's, let's kind of do it again, also walking through. So at the very first position, the very first cycle of the loop, I becomes a one. And then we systematically do these four things. So I'm going to do them right now. One, two, three, four. Now let's look over here and see what happened. It was the first flip. I was one. The first outcome, when I, because I just redid this, the first outcome was a zero. So the proportion of heads is zero and the proportion of tails is one. Okay, so after we've cycled through, what happens to I is it becomes a two because that's the next thing in this vector. And then we're gonna do this again. So I, let me by hand do it. One, two, three, four. Now we can see over here on the second flip, when I was a two, the second outcome was a one. And now the proportion of heads is 0.5 because uh, one of these is a heads and one of them isn't. And it's just like the proportion of tails is also 0.5. So we've done that. Now we're going to make I three because the next number in this vector is a three. Okay. Then we execute the first line, the second line, third line, fourth line. We're on our third flip because I is three. The third flip outcome was another one. So now the proportion of heads has gone up. There's two out of three. 
There's only one tails, one out of three. All right, I'm going to stop uh, repeating myself here. The point of this loop is it will do this process automatically, and it will do it 100 times from 1 to 100. So let's run all of this. And now our, we've got uh, all of these vectors filled out. We could look at them. So flip goes from 1 to 100. Outcome, these are the series of coin flips. Proportion heads, OK? These, this is the proportion of heads from flip 1 to 100. Now what I do is put all of these things together in a single data frame, just like this. Now we can look at it in a table. So flip 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Outcomes are proportion heads along the way and proportion tails. Once I have it in a nice little table, I could use ggplot to make a graph. And in this graph, I've just said uh, on, along the x-axis, I want to look at flips from 1 to 100. On the y-axis, I want to look at proportion heads. And I want to see some points and a line. And I added something called geome underscore hline which allows you to identify a y-intercept anywhere on the y-axis. So I've identified this as 0.5, that's 50%. Um, and I colored it red. And what we can see is as we're flipping coins, we're, we, we get to watch kind of the history of the coin flips and the history of the proportions of heads. And what should happen over the long run, it should, should get closer to this red line. Um, because in the long run, there should be 50% heads, 50% tails. Now, we don't really see that happening here in this series of 100 coin flips. Now that we've set this up, we can go as long as we want. We could go 1,000 like we already did before. And here, we could see it bounces around in the beginning, but it starts to kind of like converge on basically 50% in the long run. All right, we've got one more thing in the concept section, one more example of a Monte Carlo simulation. And this time we're going to try to demonstrate that samples become the population as n, cre n increases. So this is like the law of large numbers. The larger our sample, the more it looks like the population. And, you know, basically if you've got some population and say it looks like this, if you take a small number of values, you might get something that looks like that, or like this, or like this, or whatever. It could be lots of different things because there's variability. But if you take a humongous sample, hundreds of millions and billions of numbers, or take basically approaching all of the total population, um, your sample is going to start to look like the population. So. Larger n, your sample looks like the population. Smaller n, it's more variable. Let's check that out in R. So I've got a little simulation that does it. Let's press play and see what goes on here. I've got, uh, okay, so I've got a graph. <laughs> Let me back up. I don't think this is super helpful in terms of um, showing, giving you a look ahead. Um, so we could read this. Our parent population will be a normal distribution, okay, with mean 100 and standard deviation uh, 50. So that's going to be our parent distribution or our population. We want to conduct a simulation that takes a sample across different ranges of n. So like a sample of like five, a sample of 50, a sample of 100 or more. We keep, keep changing the total size of our sample. And we want to calculate a sample statistic for our sample. Um, for example, when we take five numbers out, we could get the mean of these numbers. When we take 50 numbers out, we could get the mean of these numbers. When we take 100 numbers out, we could take the mean of these numbers. So we'll get these sample means. Now, if our sample 
looks like the population, what will our sample means be? Will they look like the population mean? The population mean is 100. Um, this is a question, right? Now the point is, the thing that we're trying to demonstrate is that samples become more like the population as n increases. So we should find that uh, as we increase our n, our sample size, our sample mean should start looking more like 100. When we have smaller samples, our sample mean should be maybe not. Maybe it'll be a different number. So let's set it up. We're going to initialize some variables. Here, I initialize a variable called n. And I'm just going to clear the workspace. Oops, not load. Let's clear. Clear workspace. We make a variable called n. And it is simply the different sizes of n that I want to test out. So I've got 5, 55, 105, all the way to 4,955. So we're going to take samples of increasing size, increasing in steps of 50. I want to create a place to save the mean of each sample. So these are this is going to be called my sample mean. So this is an empty vector. Here, I'm going to also save the sample standard deviation. This is another thing I know about the population, and I want to know if my sample standard deviation is also similar. So set up a little loop here, and how many times do I need to run the simulation? Well, how many different sample sizes am I going to try out? It's the length of n. So I've got uh, 100 different sample sizes in there. So I'm going to go 1 to 100 because the, the length of n is 100, right? So this effectively equates to 1 to 100, which are the numbers 1 to 100. And uh, we're going to be assigning each of these values, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to 100, to i in our loop for every step. So let's see what happens on the very first step. On this step, I sample n at position 1 values. And that, let's go to n at position 1. It's a 5. So we're putting a 5 into the R norm function. That will allow it to sample 5 numbers from a normal distribution with mean 100 and standard deviation 50. We're going to take out that sample. So if we just kind of did this by hand, make i be a 1. OK, i is 1. So n i is a 5. It's this value here. And this is going to produce five values that are sampled from this normal distribution. And for now, I'm saving them into this variable called sim sample. Now, because I just did this again, we get five different values. What I want to do now is calculate the mean of these five values. So it's 104. It's actually, that's pretty close to 100. And what about the standard deviation? It's 48. So pretty close to the population parameters. Um, cool. Now, what I'm doing here is saving the mean of my sample into position i, which is position 1, of sample mean. Now I'm going to do it again for sample standard deviation. So I've basically said, yep, I took five numbers out randomly, and I got a sample mean of 104 and a sample standard deviation of 48. Now, the loop will go on and assign a 2 to i, because that's the next number in this vector. So then, n at position i will be 55. That's the second thing in n. So that would be like putting a 55 in this place, and that would be like 
sampling 55 numbers from a normal distribution and putting them into sim sample and then calculating the mean of that and the sample sample standard deviation of that so the mean of 50 numbers was 97 and the standard deviation was 51 all right so we just repeatedly do that if we do all of it um, we will have filled out the simulation and we can put all of the results into a data frame that looks like this so when we sampled five numbers we got this sample mean and this standard deviation and so on for all of these different sample sizes all right and can you kind of tell that when you have a very large sample like five almost five thousand um, look the sample mean of this sample is very very close to 100 and the sample standard deviation is very, very close to the sample st standard deviation. We can graph the results. So there's the mean. So in this example, the mean of the samples as we increase n, it kind of bounces around 100, but it gets more tightly coupled to gets like more bang on to 100 when we have a really large n this one looks at the standard deviation when we have a small number of observations or n in our sample the standard deviation it, it's close to 50 but it bounces around 50 and when we have a large number it's really really close to 50 and if you go out to let's so first of all Let's go from samples of 5 to 50 in steps of 1. Let's look at this, see if we get a sense of what's going on. So our data frame now is taking samples of increasing size, but um, they only increase in size by 1. So there's a sample of 5 numbers, there's a sample of 6 numbers, there's a sample of 7 numbers, and these are all independent and different. We go up to 50. If we inspect this table, we can see that our sample mean, you know, it's kind of bouncing around 94, oh, 100, right. We got 100 bang on. But then we got out 112, 125, 87, 88, you know, it's bouncing around. Here, our sample standard deviation is really bouncing around. So this was 108, that's supposed to be 50. This one's 63, right? So you can get sample means and standard deviations that are very different from the population that it came from, especially when the sample size is small. So let's look at the graphs. Here's our graph for the mean, and it's bouncing all over the place. If you take a sample of any of these different sizes, you could easily get means that aren't 100. Similarly, we know the population standard deviation is 50, and when our samples are small, we are getting values that could be quite different than 50. Let's do um, 1,000 to 100,000 in steps of 1,000. All right. Let's look at the data. So we took a sample of 1,000 observations and calculated the mean and standard deviation. It's close to 150. As we keep increasing the sample size, notice what's happening to our sample mean. It's basically just 100 or very close to it. When we get out to, let's go way down. So now we've got really big samples. We're like off by 0.1, 0 0.02, 0.3 we're very very close and we can see that in the plots um, this might look like things are bouncing around a lot but look at the y-axis it's between 99 and 101 so once we get out to um, I don't know 25,000 observations our sample mean is very 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 close to the population mean 
Same with the standard deviation. The y-axis range is very, very small. Almost all of our samples have a, pop, a standard deviation of 50. Okay, so that is it for our first introduction to Monte Carlo simulations. When you get to the generalization assignments, uh, there's going to be a solution video for this, but I just want to point out the first two uh, things aren't terribly difficult. We're going to sample uh, some observations from a normal distribution and compute the mean of each sample and plot the means in ggplot. We're also going to calculate the standard deviation of samples and make some error bars. So I think you should be able to combine some of what you've learned in lab two and this lab to accomplish those goals. The last two problems um, are a little bit more involved and please attempt them and definitely watch the solution videos for these ones. We're going to take a look at using a Monte Carlo simulation to understand the concept of a biased or unbiased estimator. What we've been doing in this lab, we were taking samples out of a population and we were wondering about whether our sample mean or sample standard deviation was similar to the population mean or standard deviation. We were potentially using sample statistics to estimate population parameters. And it turns out this is something you can do and some statistics of samples are reasonably unbiased estimators of the population um, parameter. Other statistics may or may not be or may be corrected. And so take a gander at the description of these problems and let's see if we can use a Monte Carlo simulation to demonstrate these concepts for us. And I'll um, say bye now and come back with a solution video for uh, all four problems.